Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We welcome our visitors. Glad to see all of you. We have quite a few people away on vacation this weekend and then some sick, disabled to be here, but glad you're here. And I hope we have a good radio listening audience. So you out in the radio listening audience, may God bless you for tuning in and pray for us. Tell somebody about it. Have them to tune in. And we appreciate it very much. Now this is Preach Edwards coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Nancy just told me this morning about a tape that she sent her son David, who's in the Air Force down in Valdosta. On my tape, I believe, is last Sunday, Sunday before last. And how David uh, listened to it down there, along with other men in the Air Force. Such a great blessing. So we hope David will enjoy this one. If she sends him a tape, I'm sure she will. And we wish him the best and his friends there as they listen to it. You never know when you bring a message on the radio or put it on tape who's going to hear it. Or where it can be a blessing. Glad to get the word of God out every way we possibly can, by radio, by tape, by print, or whatnot. And we're living in the last days of this grace age. If there's ever been a time when we need to get out the true gospel, it is now. We appreciate the beautiful flowers placed here by the courtesy of Carol and the Roy Carnes family. Roy went on to be with the Lord last week, and the, the family placed this, these flowers here. We appreciate them so very much, and we pray and for the Roy Carnes family. Take your Bible today and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, page 703. In the original Schofield Reference Bible, that's page 703. In the original Schofield Reference Bible, I'm glad to see you turning in your Bible. That's why I highly recommend the original Schofield Reference Bible, because we give you the page number, and it's a Bible most used today by fundamental Bible believers. I wouldn't have one of these RSVs or Good News for Modern Man or any of those modern translations. Wouldn't waste my time on even looking at them. I believe in the old-fashioned Bible, the old King James Version. Amen. The 1611. And I have uh, several of those Bibles right now in my study. I've accumulated that I might be able to Help our people out at a discount, save them maybe from 10 to $15 on each Bible. I do have a few on hand. When I can get one at a good bargain where I can help those out that want them, I do so. And because I want to get the good King James Version in every hand I can. And always bring it to church and I can give you the page number. Now if I didn't give you the page number on Ecclesiastes chapter 10, some of you would take you a good while to find it, I'm sure. Because it's over in the Old Testament and it's not easy found. But if I can give you the page number, you can turn there and I want you to stay there. Keep your Bible open there because I'm going to expatiate upon these verses. And I do want to be of help to you from the Word of God. I'm going to speak today on this subject, Dead Flies in the Ointment. Dead Flies in the Ointment. You know what a fly is. You see many of them, I'm sure. And it speaks here about a dead fly. Dead flies in an ointment. Now, this tape is number 338. If you'd like to have the tape, the music, the singing, the message, then you write in and send a gift of $3. Request the tape by number 338 or by the title of it, Dead Flies in the Ointment. I'll get the tape right in the mail to you. I want to once again make mention of my book on the 52 seven-point outlines on the Holy Spirit. We have several visitors with us yet today. They might be interested in this book. You and the radio listening audience might be interested in it. I have a picture of my wife and myself on the back, one of my latest pictures. 52 seven-point outlines on the Holy Spirit. If you write in and close a gift of $4 or more, request the book, I'll send it to you. If you're here in the auditorium where we won't have to mail it out, or uh, you can take the book for a $3 gift on the broadcast. And then we have uh, Brother David Lewis's book on the Song of Solomon. Very beautiful book. Brother David's not well today. He and his little son 
They're not well, and I hope that they listen to the broadcast and soon get strong and well again. David has a real wonderful book here next to Jesus of the Song of Solomon. He goes ahead and, and he enlarges up on each verse, explains each verse, and then over in the back, he gives you the meaning of each word. Now that's wonderful, the outstanding words in the Song of Solomon. There's a lot of great truth in this Song of Solomon, a lot of typology. A picture here of the Savior, the church, and many beautiful things. A lot of people overlook that great book. You ought to read it and reread it. Great love stories in there pertaining to David and people in his day, or rather Solomon. Solomon and people in his day, Solomon wrote it. And then a picture of Christ in the church and, of course, God the Father. It's rich indeed, very meaty. And then when you write in, if you'll enclose an extra dollar and request the book, we'll turn your address over to David. He'll send you the book. But it costs a dollar more to mail this book out. That's not anything for the printing. And I know if you could do better than that, you can send more than a dollar. David appreciated it. Help pay for the printing. And he's kind about sending them out at the cost of just mailing them out. And I doubt he can get it mailed out for a dollar. But if you send in a dollar, he'll be willing to pay the expense on the printing in order to get this book in your hands. Just say, send me the book by Brother Lewis, and we'd be glad to the Senate of the Song of Solomon. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. During these hot summer days, many people forget about the broadcast as faith ministry. But may God bless you as you remember us in these days and stand by this home mission work. Dead flies in the ointment is my subject. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I'll read only a few verses, but I will be explaining other verses as we move along. I'll only read a few verses to conserve time. When I read about these flies and read about flies in the Bible, I'm always reminded of the old filthy fellow sitting under the tree and, and uh, his face is dirty and tobacco juice running down his face and all dripping off his chin and on his clothes and sitting there. And he had a, just a little hair around the edge of his head. And, and the flies came in, began to light on his head. He didn't bother about shooting them off. He just let them stay up there. He didn't care. And after a while, a yellow jacket lit on top of his head. Now, a yellow jacket, you're looking at that man, you're looking a fool straight in the face. Out in Texas last week, whenever the atheists got together, they have their conventions. And up in Nebraska, I believe, up, up somewhere, maybe South Dakota, someplace up there, the, the uh, drought is so bad, they're losing their crops. And they're gathering together and praying, having days of prayer for rain. When that bunch of fools out in Texas heard about that, they made light of them and spoke evil of them, even praying. They objected to them praying for rain. Well, only a fool would object to that, object to talking to God that doesn't believe in God. Anybody's got to have sense and one good eye can see that uh, something had to, some supreme being had to create this earth on which we dwell and all the planets and so forth. It just didn't happen. It didn't, it didn't come a big boom and all of a sudden the earth came into existence. That's a lie of the devil. The evolutionist tells that lie. Beloved, God created the heavens and God created the earth. God created the stars and the moon. The Bible tells us so, and yet you have people so foolish they won't believe the Bible and believe the theory of evolution. Man has to be pretty dumb to believe what they teach about many things when they know the Word of God, but uh, people, a lot of them, believe that stuff. And so we know foolishness is a fly in the ointment of your Christian sojourn. If you're forever talking about foolish things and acting a fool, that's a dead fly in your ointment. That's a hindrance to you in the cause of Christ. You need to weigh your words. Let it be seasoned with salt. And not always be carrying on a bunch of foolishness. It's all right to use a little humor. It's good for you to laugh. A good old laugh will do you good. If you hadn't laughed in a good while, you ought to try to get tickled about something and laugh a while. It'll help you. The Bible says, A merry heart doeth good 
like a medicine. And so it's good to be happy. It's good to laugh. It's good to be joyful. And you need to realize that. But to be forever can on something foolish and somebody asks you a question and always giving them a foolish answer, then that's a fly in the ointment of your sojourn for God. Number two is the fly of stubbornness. That's found in verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yieldeth pacifieth great offenses. Now he says yielding pacifieth great offenses. Now he speaks here about stubbornness of being stubborn. Now you can be stubborn to your own hurt. It's all right to be stubborn in the things of God and, and not compromise when you know that you're standing on the word of God. But you have some people are so stubborn until you can't tell them anything. I had a very close relative and I loved him and we grew up together and went to school together and played together and uh, almost like brothers. And I talked to him many, many times about his way of living. He was a habitual cigarette smoker. He'd light one off or another, kept one in his fingers practically all the time. He was a drunken He'd drink all day, he'd set the stuff down by his bed at night, and all during the night, he'd take a drink from the bottle. When he'd go to work on his job, he'd fill a, a, a jug full of whiskey instead of water or tea or coffee, carry it to him to work. Of course, the, the uh, overseers thought he had coffee or tea or something in the thermos jug to drink for his lunch, but always have liquor in there. I looked him in the face many times and called him by name and told him, I said, man, you can't stay here much longer. Your body will never take it. You cannot, you cannot live long. But he was so stubborn, so hard headed, just like pouring water on a duck's back. You couldn't tell him anything. And he finally died at the age of 44 with lung cancer. I preached his funeral. Beloved, he could be alive today. He was a fine, tall, handsome, clean, cut fellow in that respect. He could be a very nice, handsome looking old man today with a head full of white hair. He had beautiful big blue eyes, square shoulders, about six feet two. Very handsome man. I've often thought about had he not been so stubborn and so hard headed and had lived right and done right, he'd have been a handsome old man today. And might have lived to be a hundred years old. Who knows? But he was stubborn, hard-headed, and it put him in the grave. Now, if you're stubborn today and you're hard-headed, that's a fly in your ointment. Nobody can tell you anything. If you have all the answers, you have fly a fly in your ointment. You need to realize that none of us know it all. Anybody, most everybody can tell us something. We can always learn something with a sojourn. If you ever get to the place where you've got all the answers... And everybody's wrong but you. You're in bad shape. Number three. Fly number three is the fly of pride in verse six. Folly is set in great dignity. And the rich sit in, sit in a low place. Now pride is a terrible sin. It's a sin that God hates. In the book of Proverbs chapter six. God enumerates there several things that he hates. And pride is one of them. Now if you ever get lifted up in pride. And think you're somebody and you're better than others, and the talent you have and the ability you have is far superior to others, you're in bad shape. Now, if you're a Christian, I'm talking now mainly, primarily about Christian people. If you're a Christian, then if you have a gift, and you do have if you're a Christian, you have a gift, you have talent, you have ability, and God will give you more talent, more gifts, and more ability if you use what you have. But until you use what you have, you'll not get any more as you walk in the light you have, God will not give you more light. And so if you are blessed by God and you, you have ability to do things for God and used of God and you let that go to your head and become proud and filled with pride, that's a fly in your ointment. Sooner or later, God will stick a little pin in your balloon and let the air out and you'll hit the ground. You'll go down. Pride will come the Bible tells us a haughtiness become before fall and pride and so forth. And so if you have the ability to do things and you're a Christian, thank God for that. Be sure that you don't let pride get in your life. 
Don't let pride get in your heart. If God bless you and uses you, you humble yourself before God. The most humble man I've ever known is minister of great men. Charles E. Fuller was a humble man. Very humble. All great giants of God have been very humble men. All great Christians have been great humble men and women. And if you allow pride to come in, it'll floor you. It'll bring you down. It'll most certainly ruin you. Like the young preacher fresh out of the seminary in the old home church. He's going to preach that Sunday. And he came strutting in his chest, throwed out his head in the air. Got up there, he's going to tell them something they didn't know. And made a flop. He couldn't think of anything. He couldn't get his message across. He couldn't preach. He was embarrassed. He dropped his head. He walked down with his head hanging down. Went back to the pew. Good old lady sitting on the front pew said, Well, if that young man had gone in the pulpit like he come out, he could come out like he went in. And how true that is. If you have the ability and you can do things or God's blessed you with wealth, then you ought to humble your heart. You ought to thank God for what you have and not let pride come in. A lot of people accumulate wealth, get a little more money than somebody else, and they allow pride to get in. They get better than their neighbors. Don't want to speak to their friends on the street, and, and they think they're just far superior to others. You're headed for a fall. That'll ruin a Christian. Number five, fly number 10, or fly number five, brother, is found in verse 10. No prayer a study. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, if dying is blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength, but wisdom profits to direct. Now that tells us there that there ought to be time of, of sharpening the sword, so to speak. Sharpening the axe. Sharpening our minds. And the way to do that is through prayer and through Bible study. And if you fail to do that, you have a fly in your ointment. If you're a saved individual, now you listen to me. If you're a saved individual and you don't have any time for Bible study and you don't have any time to read your Bible and you don't have time for prayer, you got a fly in your ointment. You'll never grow in grace and knowledge. You'll never be a strong, stalwart Christian. And you'll be subject to every wind of doctrine that comes along and be blown about if you're not careful. Be discouraged, throw up your hands, quit serving God because you fail to feed and become strong and get your feet on the ground. You need a sharp instrument. You need to read your Bible. And you need to pray as a Christian. If you don't do that, you have a fly in your ointment. Then we come to fly number six, and that's found in verses 11 and 12, and that's a loose tongue. Look at verses 11 and 12. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. And a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. But the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Now what is God telling us there? God is telling us there that we have two ears and one mouth and one tongue. And, and we ought to listen more than we speak up many times. We need to realize if we are not careful, we can use our tongue for evil and to get us into trouble. There's a preacher one time, great man of God, someone said to him, said, Sir, the more you preach, the, the less you say, rather, the more you preach. Well, in other words, sometimes we can say a lot and not uh, say a lot of words and phrases and sentences and paragraphs and never really get anything said. The old saying is, an empty wagon makes the most noise. An empty barrel will make the most noise if you roll it down the hill. And a person that's filled with the Spirit of God, saturated with the Word of God, and be careful what he speaks, is a wise man. We had a great deacon in our church some time ago. He very seldom ever said anything. He'd stand around and listen. Very nice fellow, one of the finest fellows we ever had in our church. And still... A deacon in this church, but he's he's not able to be here. And he was filled with the Spirit of God, loved God, uh, served our church treasure here for 21 years. Great man, Brother Cooper. Brother Cooper didn't say very much, but what he said meant something. And I said to him one day, I said, Brother Cooper, 
Uh, you're not saying very much. You don't talk very much, do you? He said, well, he said, if I, if I keep my mouth shut, said somebody might think I know something. But if I start talking, they'll find out I don't know anything. And he was a wise old man. He, he knew the way his words, words would make him count. A lot of people can talk a half a day and say nothing. A lot of people can talk uh, two minutes and say a lot of things. So let's be careful about our tongue. A three-inch tongue can run a six-foot man in a matter of minutes. It surely can. It can run a woman. It can run a man. And we need to watch what we say because words are spoken. They go out and you can't bring them back. And sometimes you can say things and when it gets back to you, you won't recognize it. Everybody will pass it on to someone else and they'll pass it on and pass it on. And when it gets back to you, you won't recognize what it is and really you start it. So be sure what you say and what you start is the truth and not hearsay. Now hearsay will get you in trouble. If you start some hearsay and it's negative and doesn't help anybody and it's really not the truth, in the end you may wind up as starting a liar. And you don't want to be a liar. You don't want to start something that's not true. So be sure what you say is the truth and not some hearsay. Because if somebody pours some slop in your ears and it doesn't sound good and it, it'll hurt your brother or sister and you really don't know that is the truth, just don't say anything about it. Don't pass it on. If you pass it on, you're going to pour fuel on the fire, cause the fire to burn bigger and do more damage. Just don't pass it on. If you don't know what you're talking about, then just remain quiet about the situation as a Christian because you can very easily get a fly in your ointment there. Fly number seven is unpreparedness, verse 15. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Now that speaks of unpreparedness. That certain things we can know and should know as a Christian. And many of us go day in and day out unprepared. Now, the best preparation you can get as a Christian is from the Word of God. What does God say about it? Where is it found in the Scriptures? I want, to, I want to learn more about it. Be prepared. When you come into God's house on Sunday, if you're a musician, if you're a singer, then you ought to come prepared. A lot of times the Sunday school teacher I've known in days gone by, I don't think we have a teacher like that today would do this. They run in the class and say, well, I didn't have time to prepare the lesson this week, and so we'll just all read it together. Have you ever heard that? Had all the week. A Sunday school teacher ought to start preparing their lessons on Sunday afternoon and continue doing so until the next Sunday. Musicians, sometimes a musician will come in that's a singer maybe. Hadn't sang a song in a week, hadn't looked at a song book. Reached down, grab up a book and try to sing a song. Hadn't tried to sing in, in a year. And uh, they know they can't be the best for God. Every singer ought to be sharp and know his song and uh, learn maybe some new songs occasionally and still sing the old songs or sing the new songs and practice them during the week and sing on your job and have them down ready like a gun with the hammer pulled back ready to shoot when you're called on. Not grab up something you can't halfway do the job and can't halfway sing it and then uh, foul around and mess up other people in the choir. You shouldn't do that. You're going to answer God for that. That's being unprepared. You have a responsibility to be prepared to do the job that you can do. You ought to prepare yourself. Be ready. Be ready on the Lord's day. Because you may be called on to do something for God. If you're ushering the church, you ought to think about ushering how that you can do the best job. How you can speak to a business when they come in. Some mother with a crying baby might need your advice and help. Or there may be something you can do. Be a good usher. Don't sit around half asleep and, and things going on you need to do. Be a good usher. If you're the uh, janitor in the church, be a good janitor. Do a good job and, and do the job well. Whatever you do for God, you ought to do it. Give it your best. 
God didn't call us all to do the same thing. There's too many church members unprepared. You to sing in the choir. You ought to practice those songs even during the week. And uh, sing them. And when you come to the choir on Sunday, then you're in better shape to do a good job. This is God's business. Don't play around about it. If you want to go out here and sing and shoot them down, Johnny, or pistol pack and mom out there during the week, that's between you and God. But when you come to God's house, you ought to come ready to do your best. Your song's on your heart, on your mind, ready to do a good job. You musicians that play this instrument, sit around all the week, and you've got a, an instrument in your home, you never touch it, you never play it, and you come in here on Sunday, and, and just like you're right up on the job, you'd be on the job better if you do a little practicing during the week. If you've got a piano at home, you're all running by the, out of the house at least twice a day. Just start playing and, and uh, play it every day. Play it till you go to bed at night. And uh, get on the job. Do the job. Whatever kind of instrument you have, do the job. You may say, preacher, there are people in my house get tired of it. Well, then go out in the yard. Just do the job that God wants you to do. Do it to the glory of God. Unprepared. Then we find the fly number eight, and that's childness in verse 16. It said there, Woe to thee, O land, when the king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Childless. You know, you have some people in your church that has been babies for years, hadn't grown an inch in 30 years, or maybe 20 years, or 10 years, and just babies. You know, that, that creates a hardship on the pastor. If we had a little bunch of little babies in our house, and me and my wife had to, uh, give them their feet all the time, bottles and whatnot, and keep us all tied up and run us to death, seemingly, if we had them in our house. But you take in the church, you have a bunch of babies that never read the Bible, they never grow, they never pray, they never witness, never try to win any souls, come to church when they feel like it, sit at home when they want to, and the least little thing that comes along many times can flatten them out. It's like a child, they get... get just flattened out about the thing and all upset about it. We need to be grown men and women. In malice be children. But in the work of God be men. Be strong. And don't be a little child that can be pushed over, slapped and go around crying half the time. You need to be a strong Christian. Now you have to start out as a baby. But as you grow up you don't want to be a baby 10 years later. You don't want to be a baby 20 years later. You don't want to be a child in childish things until you die. You want to grow up in God and grow up in the things of God. God tells you to do so. If you don't, you've got fly, a fly in your ointment right there. You need to get that fly out. And uh, number nine, fly number nine is laziness in verse 18. In verse 18, but much slothness, the buildeth decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. He tells you there, if you don't prepare your house, you're going to, it's going to fall in on you. Now, uh, laziness, laziness will absolutely cause the house to fall in. Now, most of us can do more than what we do. And if we get too lazy to do anything we should do for God, we invest it. We got flies in our armor. We need to be uh, smart and not lazy in the things of God and study and prayer and witnessing and serving God in faithfulness and not be a lazy Christian. Finally, we find fly number uh, 10, and that's in verse 19. And that's the wrong use of money. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answers all things. Now, there's a wrong use of money, and there's a good use of money, right use. And God gives you wisdom to earn your living. You have an income. And when you take that income and God gives you, then you, God is going to give you wisdom to know how to spend it. There's no need of just throwing it away. There's no need of just uh, doing something with it. It's no good. Uh, you need to be wise in what you use your money for. Of course, number one, you ought to be sure that God gets his part. And then the other you have left, your nine-tenths, you ought to spend that wisely. Uh, know how to spend it. Know what to buy and what not to buy. Don't buy everything you see. A lot of people say, well, there's a sale on out there today, and I'm going to the sale and uh, see what to God. You'll go out there and buy a lot of junk that you don't need just because it's on sale. You're not saving anything that way. 
You didn't need it to start with. You just bought it because it's on sale. A lot of times you go out with these credit cards. Got your pocket full of them. And if you didn't have them things, you wouldn't go buy everything you saw. But you'll go buy something those credit cards and fill them up and pay all that big interest on that and be paying on it 12 months from now. If you throw those things away and only spend cash for what you buy, you wouldn't spend all your money every time you went to town and have to pay for it during the next 12 months. Now, those credit cards, I wouldn't have one of them myself. I don't intend to get one. I don't have one. wouldn't have one. If you got them, that's your business, but I'm not going to pay interest myself and go out and buy something I don't need just because i got a credit card. You'll spend money from a credit card much quicker than you'll spend cash. You'll do that. You say, well, i got a credit card. I'll pay a little and now a little later. And a little. I'll pay it off before the interest comes due. Then you come on and buy something else, and the next thing you know, you're paying interest. Those credit cards can do great damage to you. Now, some of the business people might be listening today, but I'm trying to help you. They're trying to help themselves. I'm trying to help you. You'd be better off if you didn't have a credit card. And only spend cash for what you buy. You wouldn't throw away half as much money as you throw away. That's a good use for money and a bad use for money. And if you throw away your money and don't know how to spend it, and not able to spend it, don't know how to manage, don't know how to take care of your bills and so forth, you got an ointment in your, you've got a fly in your ointment. You'd do well to get that fly out of your ointment. You ought to do it because he certainly isn't there. It's going to cause you trouble and you never get on your feet. You never get your head above water. You'll never be able to save up anything to mount anything. Never have nothing when you grow old. Get that fly out of your arm. I'm minding a Jew one time, but people sent it to the table. And uh, this, they noticed this Jew down here is making a motion. And they looked to see what he's doing. He caught a fly. And he had him by the back of the ears. And he said, spit it out, buddy. You're not getting away with my feed, food. Spit it out. I paid for this. He can make that fly spit out that food he'd eat. You're only going to get away with it. Now we need to realize we need to be careful and not too stingy, but uh, be stingy enough not to be a waster. Amen? Amen. Now I've, I've brought out some flies in your ointment. They are flying around your head. You know I brought them out. Turn them loose. Get your fly swatter and take care of them. Amen? Don't have a good fly swatter, so get you one. And this is one of the best I know of right here, as far as those flies in your arm. Get this fly swatter, so kill every fly that comes your way. Don't let them get in your arm. Let's stand our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you use the message, not only here in this auditorium, but out in the radio listen audience. Pray that your name might be honored. God help us to kill these flies flying around with the word of God, and help us to be used of thee. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Deb is going to play for us as she plays. You may be here needing salvation. You may be here wanting to come back into fellowship with God. You may be here wanting to join the church. You may be here in need, and you need to come forward, and I'll be glad to help you. If at all possible, if you just come down here and let me help you today. Would you come while she plays? Speaking, disobey it. That's all I ask you to do.